Hi, my name's Jemima Ashley, and I am on the online prosperity show today, and I'm very excited to be here. I am the creative director of Tang's Design, uh, the director of Epic Social, and one half of the business experiment. I work as a mentor and a coach for people, and also I'm one of Australia's top 10 female entrepreneurs. I'm passionate about working with startups and love all things in business. And I'd love to have a chat with you today about all of those things and trips and chicks in business. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I brought you Jemima. Jemima, how are you doing, my love? Hi, I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Fantastic. And we are so excited about all the stories you're going to be telling us about your journey, which is a very interesting one, starting off in the Australian government, and now you're running your own um, business. And... Um, in Australia, a lot of people know Jemima as the creative director of Tang's Design and also the director of Epic Social. She's also one half of um, the podcast well known over there as the Business Experiment Podcast. Now, however, Jemima works as a mentor and she also helps small businesses to actually use practical strategies to grow and start up their own businesses. Now, I can't thank you enough for your time, Jemima. and um, Please introduce yourself um, to the audience. I might have just butchered your your introduction right there. Uh, you've nailed exactly what I would normally say about myself. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, ex-law enforcement, um, turned entrepreneur and uh, jack of all trades. So uh, I work here as an entrepreneur in Canberra, Australia. Love my job. Best thing I've ever done. Uh, totally different to law enforcement though. Good. Absolutely. Tell us about your time when you sort of maybe left university and the first thing you looked for was a job. Um, you know, what sort of place were you as compared to the person you are today? Uh, um, so I grew up in a law enforcement household. My entire family is in law enforcement. So that's what I knew. And that's what I went and did because I loved it. I still love the job. I still do. But um, so I finished university. I finished with an undergraduate uh, in national security and ended up getting a position working in a prison and uh, then went on to work in the court system, which was pretty phenomenal before landing a position in uh, Victoria Police and then later Australian Federal Police. So the person I was then was, um, I, you know, loved law enforcement. I still love law enforcement, but I have recently found out that I'm a millennial and I happen to be in the cutoff year of the millennials, so it turns out I am one. And um, I didn't really like having to work for other people. I did, I, it never really felt good to me to have positions where I was required to continually ask for leave or that uh, my time wasn't my own. I had to work on someone else's clock and I didn't love doing that. And uh, yeah, after 10 years, I found myself in self-employment. So that was really good. Understandable. Well, I'm glad you <clears throat> you figured it out while you could, because some people wait until they cannot. And um, I just really wanted to explore one small thing before we go into what yeah. exactly it is that you do there. Do you reckon a lot of people are influenced into the decisions of their life, career choices, and or you know life choices depending on the environment of which they are brought up? Because case in point, you've just mentioned that your whole household was law enforcement. Yeah. Had it been a different yeah. environment fostering maybe entrepreneurship, would your uh, path uh, been different? Uh, I definitely would say yes to that. Um, I've always loved law enforcement. It's what I was raised in that household. It's what my first memories are around, you know, in prisons and in police stations without me actually, like, let me be clear, my parents worked there, so that's why I was there. Um, but... I think because I'm, I'm in my thirties, I grew up during that generation where we hadn't, we, we knew we had the internet, but we weren't using it to the full capability. Smartphones weren't a thing yet. Um, and online businesses were only really starting when I left high school and went to university. So I think um, I probably would have continued into law enforcement because I did love it so much. But I think there's a huge stressor now that you have the ability to go and do other things with technological advances and the internet being what it is now, anyone can be an entrepreneur with a hundred dollars in a smartphone. It's really that easy. If you're smart and you've got a really good idea, it doesn't take like the buying level is quite low. 
So I probably have ended up there. If I was maybe another generation later, I probably wouldn't have. Understandable. So obviously we would have people in the audience that are maybe still debating on leaving their secure nine to five job. You made the jump, you made the transition. And now, yeah. you know, you are an entrepreneur. Obviously you are doing well because there's a lot of um, things that you, you dwell on, but it's not always easy when you're starting and it's not always easy when you're going about starting your entrepreneurial journey. What sort of strengthened your, your journey in as much as all you knew before was being a law enforcement you know, agent yeah. and then jumping across to obscurity where you don't even know where your next meal is going to come from. Would you just maybe walk us through that m mindset shift from working up nine to five and doing the same job and waking up to yeah. being everything and anything, whatever sticks to your profile on that particular day? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, such a it's such a unique moment i remember this moment of being for the first time sitting uh i'd made the decision to leave i had permission to have um i was really i was really lucky that my position uh my and my workplace and my employer had offered me to take some leave and so i was able to take an extensive amount of leave in a sort of six month chunk just to see if this is what i wanted to do so i i held that safety net a little bit um, but I really had no intention of ever going back. Um, and I knew in my heart it was the right call. I remember the first day sitting on my, in my desk and looking at my wall and thinking, what have you done? You, and it made sense to nobody. This is the other thing is people were scared for me. They were saying things like, you know, I had a career. I, I have multiple university degrees in this area. This is all I've known and done for 10 years. And suddenly I'm starting a business. And everyone sort of went, you just burnt out. You need a career break. Um, you need a bit of time off. You'll feel better in a few months. And it was the most liberating and terrifying decision all in one because suddenly, you know, it's akin to throwing yourself off a cliff, right? And then trying to build a parachute on the way down because I don't know what's going to happen. I made a decision to start a business. This is where the you know you have to have fearlessness in this and you have to trust your idea and follow the journey so you know you have to be paying attention or you'll miss it because the journey is so important and if you you know people want to control what that's going to look like you kind of just have to go with the flow my first week of entrepreneurship i had done um what everyone told me i should do and save three months worth of salary um before i left and in the first week, my car was totaled in a freak hailstorm. The whole thing was totaled and my laptop died. So I was suddenly like out of pocket all of my money. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm just going to have to make it work. And I did. So it's a funny thing when you don't, when your choices are do something you want to do and something you don't want to do, how much you'll make the thing that you really want to do work. Right. A lot of people, <clears throat> thank you so much for bringing or shedding light to that part. A lot of people would say they are pursuing um, entrepreneurship because it's their calling or they're pursuing mm -hmm. whatever it is that they're doing to help other people be, do and have because that is their calling. Would you place what you do now as a passion or is it something that you did as a rebellion considering everybody was doing that and you probably did not like the rigidity of what the career you were in was bringing across to you? Um, yeah, I certainly felt the rigidity. I don't like it. I, uh, I was a bit exhausted by the whole thing. And yeah, I was a little bit rebellious in that sense. I was like, I want to go now. I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I remember, you know, there were decisions that I made. I had um, sort of started dabbling in entrepreneurship before I left, but I remember being at work in my paid nine to five job and going, I don't want to be here. And I was thinking about the stuff I was going to do tonight, how I was going to help, how I was going to do other things outside of my career. And it's, it's a big thing deciding you don't want to be somewhere, especially when that's well, the only place you've ever been before. Understandable. So you had family, friends, everybody else that you'd known, you know, um, you burned the boats literally and uh, yeah. jumped across and you joined us. Welcome aboard. Um, 
where you had no safety net, where you had no one to turn to. You live in a country or in a, in a, in a city where the rest of the people are waking up to go and, you know, file in some sort of a file to report to some sort of a location that they are intending to be paid for. And you have, you know, made that leap and, um, you know, without, uh, you know, looking back or turning back, doesn't that freak you out? I still have moments where I realise that it was a big jump. Um, I do remember very early on that it felt a lot scarier at the very, very start. Now it's, you know, it takes a little while for you to get used to it, but I'd say about 18 months, two years, you kind of get a bit used to not really knowing where your paycheck's going to come from. But the big thing that I found was that I, people were scared for me and it usually manifested with people saying, so you were in law enforcement, you now do jewelry, you have a podcast and now you're doing social media. Can you explain that to me? And, and I have to apologize to my friend because he just happened to get me at the wrong time. And I eventually just went, no, I'm not explaining this to you. My decisions are my decisions. And my job at this point is to do my job and to show you that this isn't a bad move. My job is not right now to explain to you my life choices. The other thing is, I think there are a lot of people who will be watching the show who look at this and go, well, it's fine. It's fine for you, but not for me. I could never leave my job. You know, here's the thing. I've done it. You can as well. It is hard. I'm not going to, I don't mince words. If anything, you know, I will tell it exactly how it is. And there are days where it is easier to go back and get a job. It is. Here's the thing. It's not a better option for me. I'm much happier now. I'm much better off. My health, my well-being, my family, we're much happier from where I am. Are we on as much money? Not quite. <laughs> Has it gotten better over the last two years? Yes. Understandable. So it's only a matter of time and things start taking shape, right? So yeah. what has strengthened you in the process? You, you didn't have support around where you are. Your environment was not supportive. Where did you then gather all this um, strength to say, you know what, you guys do what you're doing. I'm going to be on the other side and this is what I'm going to show you at the end of it all. I think the biggest strength that I was able to draw was um, from surrounding myself with people who are in similar situations. So I'm a big believer of the statement, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think it is we undervalue how amazing people can be who are around us and how much they influence what we're doing. So for a long time, all of my friends worked in the public service. So when we would see each other, we spoke about public service stuff. We didn't talk about, we talked about government, we talked about jobs, we talked about our bosses and promotions. Whereas I suddenly had to go and find new people. Firstly, I found people online. So my first mentors came in the forms of people like Mel Robbins and Sheryl Sandberg and Gary Vaynerchuk and Tony Robbins. These people gave me the confidence and the energy. Like these were my original summer five people you're pretty bulletproof if you've got those people on your side. Even just mentally and they're saying, I believe in you, I'm going to believe in me too. What would later happen is I would go to networking groups. I would start working. I'd meet other people who were doing this. And um, I've also done a lot of improvisation and comedy. And one of the things that I found was, you know, this was the real eye-opener for me, that there are a lot of people making money doing jobs that weren't behind desks. There were people having creative careers and I loved them. And I just was immediately envious. When you have these moment of, moments where you're envious of other people, you know, you need to be paying attention to that. What does that look like? So for me, a lot of it was just getting good mentors and good role models around me. Some were online and most of them were just finding really, really good people. Understandable. Yeah, because I did uh, notice a picture of you and um, Gary Vaynerchuk when he was doing a trip yeah. tour around Australia. That, that, that would have been, you know... Um, <clears throat> phenomenal moment where you actually get to meet somebody who's been teaching you for all these times in real flesh. Explain to us that moment of, of, um, you know, you meeting Gary V and, um, you know, what that meant to you as first of all, somebody who wouldn't have been in that position had you not made that shift. And second of all, having listened to them so much that it strengthened you and getting to actually touch the ham and meet them in person and, um, you know, be and breathe the same air as the person who actually strengthened you 
threw out when your blood relations did not even care what you were going to do, um, you know, with your life? What, what, what was going through your mind when, when that particular moment happened? Uh, yeah, so I had the opportunity to meet Gary at um, an event in Sydney and um, I had the opportunity to uh, watch him present, not only on stage, and I was provided with a front row seat, which was pretty incredible. Like, this was great. I was within a metre from him the entire day. And he spoke, when he spoke from stage, he spoke directly from in front of me. Like, he was within a metre. So this was a little bit of a surreal moment for me because... You know, I listen to his podcast every day. I, I've read all of his books. I have listened to every one of his books. I have them all on audiobook and I have re-listened to most of them at least a couple of times. And I just remember having a moment where I closed my eyes and I was listening to him talk, thinking I could be at home just cooking dinner and listening to a podcast or going for a run and listening to his podcast. But I looked up and he was there. And um, it was a really, really sort of fortuitous moment where... Gary had made a joke about, you know, you can do anything that you want in the world and if you're telling me you don't have the resources, that's not good enough. You can do better. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this down. And he says, G-O-O-G. And I look up, realising he's spelling Google. And I look up and I meet his eye directly and he says, L-E. And then he watches me write L-E down. And then he starts laughing because he's watched me write Google. Of course I've heard of Google. And later, like he had a bit of a laugh and told the audience, I've just watched a few people write Google down. And later in the meet and greet, he's like, hey, it's the girl who wrote down Google. And wow. um, <laughs> so, like Gary remembers me. So firstly, like and he, when he'd originally walked down on stage, he'd waved and came and gave me a high five. So it's pretty like it was pretty surreal um, he's just a cool dude and I'm, I'm honoured to kind of be able to call myself an entrepreneur as well. We ended up having a bit of a chat and um, I did watch a lot of other people uh, in that um, in that line and in that queue of people and he was really quick with a lot of them. I got it, like a minute face-to-face -face with him and my favourite thing about my photo with him, I hate the photo of me, I hate it because we're mid-laughing but Gary is actually laughing so that's really cute that we've got this adorable photo of both of us laughing and he said oh you're really funny um i told him i loved him he said he loved me too i was like my, my life is sorted so top five uh memories absolutely um and then later i would get an email from a friend of mine saying have you watched the latest gary v video um and me and my friends were actually in the video in his daily v episode so that was pretty incredible as well Wow, so you've carved yeah. not only a memory with him, spoken to the man and, you know, yeah. actually got to be featured in a video that's going to last and transcend all of humanity. Well done. Yeah, like, so I'm so tiny. I want to be really clear here. Like, I'm so tiny, but it's me. And you can see <laughs> all of my friends, the people. One of us is wearing a hat and, like, that's us. Um, and so that was pretty incredible. Like, that was pretty awesome. Um, you know, he's a, he's a really cool dude. And he was everything that I thought he would be. You know, they say, don't meet your heroes. You can meet some of your heroes. Understandable. So you two also run a podcast and yes. um, you are helping small to medium businesses there. Would you think people would have that sort of feeling when they get to now meet you in person after having listened to your podcast um, with all the value that you are giving out? How would that make you feel? Um, so we've had that a few times. So I'm a co-host with a girlfriend of mine. So Siobhan Joyce from, um, she lives in Brisbane in Australia. And uh, we've both had that opportunity where we've met people who have recognised us and us from the podcast. We have a reach of about over 4 million people and um, we're in over 60 countries now. So we have a fairly large following and it is a little bit surreal to have that moment because I'm st I feel like I'm still, you know, very much a work in progress to where I want to be. Um, it has been a bit funny to sort someone to sort of ask to have a photo with you. That's sort of the moment that kind of blew me away a little bit. You've probably had this yourself. But it's, it's kind of a really humbling and beautiful experience at the same time. But it's always nice to know the good that you're doing. That, you know, we started this podcast as really a tool for us to document our journey and to talk about the things that we had learned because no one was helping us and we wanted to be the change that we sought. So we, we made this podcast for our listeners. So it's really nice to know that we actually did some good with that. And um, yeah, so it's been going for about 18 months now. It's been a hell of a journey. It's great. 
Understandable. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just going back one more time to your law enforcement days, there's a lot of discipline that's involved in, um, in that sort of work. There's a lot of, uh, like we mentioned, rigidity, um, which is also, if you really look at it, you have to be disciplined as an entrepreneur. You have to be rigid, um, guarding your time, guarding your energy, guarding the people you actually really talk to and guarding your influences because you might listen to the wrong person and then just lead your business to um, another way there. Would you say your 10 years in the law enforcement have actually helped you to shape the entrepreneur you are today, um, you know, taking in from whatever lessons you would have taken up um, on your way up? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that uh, law enforcement helped shape me. I would say that law enforcement really helped me become, um, firstly, I learned how to work and have my brain to function when I was exhausted because law enforcement things go wrong all the time and just because it's home time doesn't mean you get to go home. So I learned very, easy, very early on about, you know, how to work when you're tired and about times in the day that I was good for working. Um, I know how to work at night time. I know what my good times to work and when, when my preferences are because of my time in law enforcement. Uh, from a discipline point of view, it's been um, extremely helpful. Uh, I had to learn to give myself deadlines. One of the key things that you will learn when you make the jump is that you can start in law, you can start in entrepreneurship, but once you leave that nine to five job and you go and you start working from home, it is a completely different ball game. And because you get to sit eight hours uh, at a workplace, at a computer, at a workplace where you have bosses and managers around you, when you're working for yourself, you're your boss. So if you decide that you wanna go and take a four hour lunch, you're only responsible to yourself. You can do that without a problem. Uh, the problem is the work's not gonna get done, you're not gonna get results, you're not gonna get ahead. The one thing that a boss always said to me very early on was, just put the extra hours in now and you won't have to do it later. And I think that that was something that I sort of brought across to entrepreneurship of it's a simple numbers game. If you're working eight hours and I'm working 12, I'm going to get ahead of you by two thirds very quickly. So, you know, it is just a numbers game. So, and that was one of the things my, one of my bosses used to say about just put an extra hour in where you can. And that's kind of how I've been living. Entrepreneurship is uh, one extra hour at a time. Great stuff. Well, Jemima, you've been so nice to us today and given us all this value, your expertise and the depth of knowledge that you've had, especially your story. Um, people might be watching this right now and, um, you know, figuring, wanting to figure out how they too can either make that leap or how they can talk to somebody who's been through what you've been through that can maybe, you know, knock some sense into their head and, um, just some tidbits of advice here and there, or some people that are just sitting on the fence and they're not quite sure if, you know, taking the leap is the thing for them to do. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, so the best place to find me on my website, which is jemimaashley.com.au. Okay. Understandable. I will be putting in all those, um, uh, details, you know, right at the, at the bottom there. Now, would you have any last words for, you know, people that are watching this show and they've heard your story and maybe you just want to, you know, strengthen them if they haven't taken the leap yet and, you know, just tell them that it is possible. Yeah. So, um, the biggest piece of advice that I can give anyone that's looking at starting their entrepreneurial journey is that you are never going to feel like it. And what I mean by that is that there are so many people that I meet who say, when this happens, I will do it. When I have this amount of money in the bank, I, I don't, and then it's always followed with, I'm not ready yet. And one of the key things that I can tell you is from working with hundreds of entrepreneurs now is that you're ever, never actually going to feel like it. You're never going to wake up and be like, today is exactly the day I'm going to start the business. And if you make that decision, I can guarantee you there's 50 subsequent decisions you're not going to feel like making. So there is the only time you've got is now. It's the only time that's guaranteed to you. So if you're going to do it, do it now. Don't be scared of it. It's, you know, it's one of those 
amazing things that you're never going to regret doing, but don't live with any regrets because you're never going to feel like it. Just do it now. Understandable. Well, Jemima, thank you so much for your time today and your level of expertise and your story particularly. And congratulations once again, your for your fight has been fought. Uh, we're just probably going to wait and see what the legislation is going to say um, in Australia, but good work you've done so far. We hope to be seeing you in the near future and hopefully somebody would watch this and recognize you on the street and say, Jemima, because of you, I did not give up. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you guys. And feel free to uh, get in touch. I'd love to hear your stories as well. Great stuff. Thank you.